Okay. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to our last seminar of the semester. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have you today, Dr. Anand Kumar uh, from University of California at Irvine. Uh, she'll be talking about her work in uh, on social networks. Uh, Dr. Anand Kumar uh, is a faculty at the ECS department at UC Irvine. She's been there since August 2010. Her current research interests uh, are in the high dimensional statistics and machine learning uh, with uh, uh, leaning on learning probabilistic uh, graphical models and uh, latent variable models. Uh, she was uh, recently uh, recipient of a faculty award from uh, Microsoft Research in New England and uh, she was also a postdoctoral researcher actually that's our common point here uh, at the Stochastic Systems Group at MIT and she, re uh, she actually graduated from IIT Madras in 2004 and got her PhD from Cornell in 2009. Uh, she's a recipient of uh, the ARO Young Investigator Award and NSF Career Award. And she's got uh, several uh, awards, uh, in particular the ACM Sigmetrics Best Paper Award and ACM Sigmetrics Best Thesis Award. And uh, she's also gotten an IEEE SP signal processing, that is, uh, Young uh, Best Author Award and IBM Fran Allen PhD Fellowship. It's a pleasure to have her here today. Thank you for coming. Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Samid. Uh, you know, it's been a pleasure to be here and have uh, listened to like very, you know, many interesting uh, talks by Hamid students in the morning, and I know the more interesting meetings in the afternoon. So today I'll talk about um, an approach to think about, uh, you know, communities. So you can think of this as applicable in social networks, but also, you know, broadly applicable in biological and other domains as well. So the idea, you know, one of the primary goals is to think about how we can group or cluster, you know, similar nodes or similar objects together, right? And um, this approach says that, uh, you know, first of all, what are some relevant models to thinking about modeling communities? Uh, in principle, we would like to have, you know, nodes being possibly in multiple communities at the same time. So you can think of like people having various different interests or belonging to, you know, multiple different communities at the same time. And all you see are their interactions. So the question is how, you know, how, when can you learn about their underlying communities or hidden beliefs by just looking at their interactions? Right, so this has been a classical notion uh, in sociolo sociology, I think even dating back to the 1930s, to ask about how, you know, the beliefs or interests of people, you know, how they lead to community formation and how they lead to interaction between, you know, like the different actors in the community. Right, and the, uh, you know, aspect is to think of like a, a, a model of how, say, different, um, you know, no, uh, nodes could have possibly different interests and based on that how do they go about interacting right and the, when I say community detection it's the problem of um, you know making inferences about these hidden uh, groups or communities by just looking at their interactions so one of the classical hypotheses has been to you know posit that uh, people interact because of their beliefs or interests you know like why, you know, I'm here and interacting with others is, you know, I'm interested in learning, I'm interested in signal processing, right, and related areas. So we share similar interests. And uh, so the hypothesis is that the kind of the core uh, reason behind all these interactions are our hidden beliefs or interests. Uh, that, when, that, you know, in practice we may not necessarily directly observe them, but we observe all these interactions. So from this can we map back uh, different, you know, can we say like which groups of people share similar interests and which others don't, right? So that's the whole idea of modeling communities and social networks. And the problem that I'll emphasize on is to uh, incorporate multiple communities for every person or to allow for, you know, communities to overlap. 
So for instance, if you look at like my Facebook list of friends, which indeed is a lot, you know, you can, you know, you can see that you can, I could group them into different categories, right? Family, high school friends, you know, I went to Cornell, I was at MIT, I'm at UCR1, I interact with Microsoft Research quite a bit. So, you know, I can categorize my friends into different groups. So, you know, I belong to like kind of multiple networks in that sense, right, or multiple communities. So the question is, can we first of all come up with unreasonable probabilistic models that um, incorporate these overlap among communities and yet we can learn them efficiently. So just by looking at the edges of a graph, can I fit the uh, parameters of these models efficiently? Uh, hopefully, you know, when I mean uh, sample complexities, I want to ask how, you know, how many nodes do I require or how large the network should be in order to discover a certain number of communities within them, right? Like the scaling between these parameters. And of course, I want to do it in a computationally efficient manner. Because indeed, like if you think of various social network data, you know, it's like millions of nodes or even more, right? If you want to kind of model networks on Facebook or Twitter or uh, other online social networks, these are huge. So we want to be very careful about, uh, you know, having computationally tractable methods for learning the model. So is the goal clear to everybody? So again, feel free to interrupt me at any point. I like to, you know, the talk to be more interactive. Yeah, so, you know, I, uh, I'm sure at least some of you are aware of some classical approaches for modeling communities. So this notion of a stochastic block model has been popular in various different communities, and I think it's been at least there since the 70s. And uh, there have been various even efficient approaches to, uh, that you know, assuming this model when you can learn the communities efficiently. So there's been very nice analysis for this model. So this will be our starting point, but then we'll extend them to a more general class of models where we can incorporate, again, overlapping communities. Right, so let me first describe what this model is. So broad, broadly, I think this picture kind of gives you a very good idea. So think of like here, you have nodes, like you can you know, even just visually say that this is one group of nodes, this is another group, and so on. Right, and you see that there's hardly any overlap across different groups, and also they're very you know, tightly connected within the group as across different groups, right? So kind of these different clusters are, um, telling me uh, uh, about how people are, you know, in different groups, right? So what does this uh, general stochastic block model tell me? It tells me how, you know, probabilistically I'm going to choose a group for every node. So that is one of the limitations that you can only choose one group for a node or a single community for every node. And once you choose the communities for, say, a pair of nodes, the probability of the edge is only dependent on what communities they belong to and all the edges are conditionally independent. So the nice thing about this model is, you know, you, I'm sure you are aware of the classical Erdos-Rene model or the simplest random graph model where all the edges are independent, right? And clearly if you see a picture like this, you're going to say, oh, no way these edges are all going to be independent, right? So this is modeling all these correlated edges, which is important because we know, like a, a simple independent model we know would be unrealistic for many real networks. But on the other hand, it still kind of gives us some, you know, very nice theoretical tractability because it says that, uh, you know, there are some hidden uh, labels for the nodes. This I can interpret them as their communities. And conditioned on those, I still have conditional independence of all the edges. So this makes, in some sense, the generation of edges to be still a simple model but then it introduces these additional variables at the nodes, right, which denotes the groups of nodes, uh, the groups that the nodes belong to. And I just wrote it in a fashion that, you know, I just uh, rewrote it in a way, in a more kind of, you know, using vectors to represent communities and the matrix to represent the various connectivity probability because I can, you know, then the extension to mixed membership models or the models where there's no limitation of a node being in a single community you know, will remove that um, limitation. And so that's just a, kind of a very simple way to express this. So think of I use a vector pi sub u for representing the memberships of community, uh, the community memberships of node u, right? So for instance, if I tell you that I want node u to be in community i, I'll just represent uh, 
this vector with a basis vector in that direction. So essentially, I'm just kind of uh, reparameterizing all these communities as basis vectors in k-dimensional space, right? If they're k communities, and then I know that the probability of an edge from uh, node u to v is, um, you know, certain parameter that only depends on the communities they belong to, right? So if node u had, is in community i and node v is in community j, the probability of connection I want to kind of fix it. Um, that depends only on these two community labels, and I'll call it like this PIG. So this P is then a matrix that tells me how the connectivity across different communities change, right? So this is the average connectivity across different communities. So within the same community, the graph actually is a Erdos Ruary graph, right? So conditionally, it's a Erdos Ruary. No, once I condition on the community labels, right? Once I fix them, it's all Erdos Ruary. Right, except like, yeah, you could have heterogeneous probabilities across different communities. So within the same community, it is, yeah, the same homogeneous model. Right, so, and I'm just, you know, expressing this in this uh, kind of using <laughs> vectors to represent my communities. And, you know, since I want to uh, pick a particular probability based on the community labels, I can just rewrite them as, you know, using these kind of inner products with their community vectors. Right, so you know, so in a sense, there's a lot of nice properties of this model. You can, you know, argue like concentration bounds pretty easily in terms of how different, say, degree or different like kind of properties of this model concentrate. And you can also analyze them, and there are efficient algorithms to recover these communities. And we'll, un you know, we want to, but our goal is to extend this to the case where there are also multiple communities for a person, and how we can do this efficiently. Right, so for that we'll um, you know use a model that has been proposed before, but till now there was no guaranteed method known for learning this model. So there were various heuristics based on Gibbs sampling, you know the relaxations to variational base and so on, but there wasn't a guaranteed method. But we'll see how to you know we can also make this um, uh, model also tractable. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, let me introduce what the model is. So. In effect, think of it as now, you know, for community memberships of a node, instead of limiting it to a single community, I'll make it like a general community membership. So think of like I can now have fractional memberships in different communities. And I want these, you know, weights to sum up to one. So kind of the idea is maybe, you know, I spend like, uh, you know, 80% of my time in one project, 10% so on the other, and so on, right? So I could think of it that way. And then, uh, you know, so I want to now ex remove the uh, uh, limitation of the stochastic block model. But then at the same time, I want to retain some of its nice properties. So one nice property was that all these edge generation was conditionally independent given these communities, right? And there's also a lot of nice social basis for that. And so I'm still going to retain the same. So I'm going to say that once I tell you the various memberships of nodes into different communities, uh, the edges are uh, still independently drawn, but the probability of an edge, think of it as a mixture of uh, memberships across different communities, right? So earlier, like each node just belonged to a single community, so there was just like, well, you know, a, pro a parameter for each pair of communities, right? And now I'm going to kind of mix them all up because I have like kind of fractional memberships across different communities. Okay, so this is the model. And uh, so, you know, so if we just uh, you know say that I can allow for like arbitrary memberships in uh, different communities, and I also don't know what the probability of connections are, right? So I don't know both these parameters. I don't know the vector spy at different nodes, which are the community memberships. I also don't know what the probability of connections are across different communities, right? So you see that this could be an ill-posed problem, right? So I could get the same edges by just, you know, thinking about different ways of modeling memberships of communities, as well as different parameters for modeling my connectivity across groups. And so it's not clear in general, you know, how I would like kind of be able to separate out the two. And so, you know, so we're going to make another probabilistic assumption. Yeah. So, so I think you're going to answer my question, but uh, was, is there any reason for choosing this particular model for the joint distribution? Yeah, so I'll come to that yeah. in the next slide. So, so the thing is, yeah, you know, in general, if you don't make any assumptions, it's ill-post. We don't have enough constraints. And now the question is, you know, what 
what is the space where it's still a tractable problem, we can solve it efficiently, and what, what is a reasonable model. And so I'm going to argue that this Dirichlet model I, you know, is kind of good in both those counts. And uh, you know, it has kind of this whole range of parameters where I can model varying amounts of overlap between different communities. And that's the parameter that I want to study in detail because I want to ask, as communities overlap more and more, how much harder does it become to learn the groups of different people? Right? Because intuitively, if you have a large, large number of overlap, at some point, you should not be able to distinguish that these are two different communities. Right? The, you know, the question is, in practice, what is this regime right? where you can learn efficiently? And we, we want to analyze that. And a popular one that's you know, been used uh, uh, you know, quite a lot in the machine learning community you know, earlier in kind of document modeling and other what they're called as topic models and also for these network models is to assume a Dirichlet distribution for how these communities are drawn. So assume that every node, you, know, you, have, you draw your community memberships randomly and independent of other nodes. And, uh, as, you know, and the probability, like, so this pi u is a k-dimensional vector, right? So, and the different coordinates, you just essentially exponentiate them with, uh, like, these parameter alpha g's. And these are called the concentration parameters. So I'm just going to give an intuition of what, you know, by varying these different concentration parameters, what are the uh, class of models I can obtain. Right, so first of all, how can I, you know, just kind of uh, visualize the dist this Dirichlet distribution, right? So the Dirichlet distribution has the constraint that, of course, these, you know, these different coordinates should sum up to <coughs> one, the, because, you know, think of them as they're representing fractional memberships in different communities, and of course, they have to be between zero and one, right? So it's on a simplex. So, uh, you know, a draw from this Dirichlet distribution is on the simplex, and uh, uh, the, uh, and the question is, uh, for different concentration parameters, how does this distribution look like? So if you think for a second, like, you know, if I send this concentration parameter to zero, essentially you can argue that uh, the distribution is just concentrated on the vertices of this simplex. So in the limit, what is this, right? So if it is just a distribution on the simplex, you're just obtaining basis vectors. And this was just the earlier model, right? So this was the stochastic block model that I described earlier. So one nice property is I have the stochastic block model as a special case, which I know, you know, like a lot of nice algorithms exist, so I can compare, right, as I keep increasing the amount of overlap, how, uh, like, these algorithms or, you know, how the model behaves too. And so think of, like, as I keep increasing the alpha, I'll get, like, more flow of this, uh, probability mass, you know, towards the center of the simplex. So for instance, if I set this parameter to 1, this is nothing but the uniform distribution, right? And now as I keep increasing the concentration, and that's also why it's called concentration, right? Because the mass is concentrating towards, like, the center of the simplex. And at the extreme case, when you send this concentration parameter to infinity, you have a degenerate distribution where all the probability mass is at the center of the simplex. So what does it mean? If I have a point closer towards the center of the simplex, that means it's a dense vector, right? So you have a kind of non-zero entries on all these coordinates, meaning the no, you know, this particular node has membership in all different communities, right? And in the case, in the other extreme case where, uh, you know, it was just, um, and the concentration parameter tended to zero, it was that the node belonged to just a single community. So that's a nice property of this model. You can vary like kind of the you know, extent of membership of nodes into different communities. And in effect, you are then controlling how communities overlap. Right? So this, and the nice thing is this, you know, is just like a, uh, essentially you can say like the overall concentration is just the sum of these alpha j's, so there's just a scalar parameter for me to control how, uh, you know, how these communities overlap. And uh, roughly you can also argue like with high probability that if uh, there is a certain level of concentration alpha zero, the number of non-zero entries in this vector is also of the same order. So you can also say in these intermediate regimes that if I have a certain amount of concentration parameter, I have like you know proportionally that many number of non-zero entries in the in my community membership, 
right? So this tells me like, uh, you know, if I want to kind of model that, uh, you know, people can belong to multiple communities, but realistically, right, they are not going to belong to all possible communities. I mean, if you think of research interests, sure, you know, you can list out like this whole <laughs> line of uh, uh, possible research interests, but any one person realistically could not be interested in everything, right? It's just physically impossible. Um, so we'd like to, you know, uh, think of like most realistic networks would not be having you know, too much of overlap between communities, right? So that's the regime we would like to work in. And we want to ask, you know, in this regime, is it easy to learn the model? And so I gave the intuition earlier that with increasing overlap, it should become harder for me to learn, but that depends on the method, right? Like, so can we have methods that are actually following this intuition and how we can provide guarantees on, you know, if I increase uh, the amount of overlap, how much does learning degrade? Right, so I'd like to study these uh, properties. So, and this I would say is uh, kind of nice properties of this Dirichlet distribution that you know, it lets me model overlapping communities. You know, it has the stochastic block model as a special case, and also, you know, so this has been popular in lot in Bayesian inference, right? Because the Dirichlet distribution is a conjugate prior of the multinomial. So I won't go into the details. I can talk to the, about this offline. And so, you know, you can also do inference uh, efficiently with this, right? So, and those were, you know, some of the advantages that I mentioned. Of course, you know, they're all challenging questions, right? First of all, even is this model well posed? Meaning that if I, you know, observe the graph and then I want to learn the parameters, can I uniquely recover the parameters, right? Because I have all these hidden variables, it's not guaranteed that I should be able to learn all of them, right? So that's the first question. And the second is, uh, I mean, you know, in this case, you would think of like, you know, the moments of this distribution, right? Or the, in this case, it would be the counts of various subgraphs. Even if I had them exactly, can I identify them? But of course, in practice, you're only going to have some finite number of samples or a finite size network. And uh, from that, can I learn the uh, community, right? Because think of like, I have empirical moments. I have all these perturbations. How robust is my uh, learning method? Uh, to these perturbations, and that's what I like to, you know, carefully analyze. Yeah. Is your um, model uh, empirically justified by data? Yeah. So we've been now, you know, we just tested it on some small networks, and they're very reasonable. And we are now scaling it up to very large networks. And I'll, you know, come. Hopefully, I'll have time to come to that as well. That our methods are very efficient. Like you can call them up on the GPU. And they're very kind of based on matrix, uh, you know, uh, like SVD and like kind of uh, a lot of matrix-based methods. So they're very efficient for implementation. <coughs> and uh, yeah, so in terms of the contribution, so what we provide is the first uh, guaranteed uh, results for this model, or for my, and that matter, any probabilistic or you know community model with overlaps. Uh, that show that there, is, there exist regimes where we can learn them efficiently. So we can learn uh, the community memberships of the nodes into various different communities. So meaning these vectors pi u, pi, right, for every node. And I can also learn the probabilities of connections across different communities. And so the way we go about showing it is a more moment-based method. So now I compute the, uh, if first I assume that I have exact moments available from this distribution but only some form of moments, right? Again, intuitively, we don't want to go to two high order moments, right? If we have high order moments, we can't estimate them efficiently. And so the first is to show that, you know, you can uh, identify the, uh, these hidden communities as well as the connectivity uh, across communities in an efficient way. And it requires only some low order moments. Mm -hmm. By low order moments, I mean that you only need to like, you know, you would have observed all the edges of the graph and you compute very simple subgraph structures. So these are star structures where there is only one, you know, there are only three leaves. And uh, if I, I'll come to that in a minute, if I compute like the, you know, how many such structures exist across different partitions, uh, then uh, I show that this is enough for me to uh, identify the model uniquely and also, you know, learn this in a computationally efficient manner. 
And so then the next question is, suppose I don't have exact moments, of course in practice I have to you know, co you know, compute it from my finite network. Right? So how large should the network size be compared to the number of communities that I want to learn? As well as the probability of connectivity across different communities, how that should vary. Right? So for instance, I showed you my, uh, uh, the earlier picture I had here of like these different clusters which are very densely connected within the cluster and very sparse connections mm -hmm. across clusters. Right? So here even visually you can see that you know, this is easy to classify. Right? And so intuitively, you know, the more uh, there's a strong difference between how people connect within a group versus across different groups, it should be easier to learn. And so I want to quantify based on the difference of connectivity within the group and across different groups, how that will uh, affect my learning. I was just curious, so do these networks fol follow the power law distribution on the degree? So for the degree, so these are, you know, so there are version extensions of this model where you also kind of have another degree term, right? So here I just assumed homogeneity that within the group it's all uniform probability right. p. So uh, but there are extensions to the model where, you know, even within, like, you know, once you first select like the probability based on the groups, and then there are also like a degree distribution term you can, uh, you know, incorporate. And these are extensions to the basic model. And it turns out that even these are efficient to learn in some regimes. So I won't go into those details, but yeah, you can also uh, incorporate degree, degree heterogeneity in these models as well. Yeah, well quick question. Uh, although it seems you can learn about the intrinsic properties of which communities to spend certain times for each node, uh, the number of communities is the required number or information so in practice, right, what you would do is you would tune the model, right? You would try for different communities. You would like maybe do link prediction. Maybe you'd you know validate through other means. And this is always done in practice, right? If you don't know like the dimension of the hidden parameters, or even just doing PCA, right? You don't know when to, you know, like what's the dimension of subspace you want to project to. You always just try out right different ones. Uh, is the result robust to the number of communities? Say that. Uh, saying that the best one is like five communities, but if you try four communities or six communities, what are the Yeah, so that's what, like if under these separation conditions, right, essentially if the parameters, you know, help you distinguish to learn, you should also be able to tell that with smaller number of communities, you know, it won't be the same. Not an uh, optimal thing, right? It's, it's an egocentric parameter. The number of communities that a person belongs to is very much dependent on the person. So in this case, if you... K is the overall number of communities, not the number that a person... I mean, potentially could belong to, but he could belong to a much smaller set. So, so in, okay, in this case, uh, K is assumed to be uh, the same for everybody, for the whole network. But this is the whole potential list of communities, right? Not everybody does not belong to all the K communities. <coughs> You select the subset from this key. Okay. <laughs> okay. And uh, yeah. So uh, yeah. So now that and, you know, like the uh, question is, with a finite network, how these different parameters should scale, right? Like potentially, I want to have like increasing number of communities to learn as I get more and more data. Right. This is the whole principle of high-dimensional learning that with more data, I should also be able to learn increasingly complex uh, phenomena, right? And that's why this scaling should be very reasonable, like not something crazy, right? So not like we don't want like exponential dependence, for instance. And what we show is um, like the number of uh, uh, nodes in the network should scale as like square as the number of communities. Uh, so think of like here, I've assumed uniform communities, so the size of each community is like n over k, right? So I want like n to be like order k square, or in other words, I want the size of the community should be of order root n, right? So if you're aware of the uh, planted clique problem that says, you know, there have been uh, even lower bounds that argue that any polynomial time algorithm under some query assumptions cannot uh, learn cliques smaller than square root n. So this is a classical problem in learning. It's, you know, it's called the planted clique problem, right? And so what we show is, you know, if this um, uh, concentration parameter is zero, which is the planted clique would be a special case of that, the stochastic block model, right? So in that case, we do achieve the lower bound. So this is type. So you can't do better than this for 
the um, single com you know the uh, the case where it's the stochastic block model right and uh, so interestingly now we also have that the communities can overlap so as I said, if you recall, this alpha 0 was this concentration parameter. So roughly the number of non-zero entries in any community vector was alpha 0, right, order alpha 0. So, and we see that as I keep increasing these, uh, mem you know, the extent of membership of nodes into different communities, I do have degradation in performance. This is expected, but this is very, you know, graceful, right? It's only a quadratic term. So I can increase the uh, sparsity without losing too much in terms of the learning requirements. And if you, you know, if you see that, in, as I said, in most realistic set settings, you know, you want to think of sparse community memberships, right? There are, there are still like very few communities I will belong to compared to the whole possible list of communities. So in that case, if you think of like this alpha zero as a constant, it's the same learning performance as the stochastic block model. So, you know, so in the kind of interesting setting of where we do allow for overlaps, but these overlaps are sparse, we have efficient learning. In fact, it's the same as in this uh, stochastic block model case. And the other interesting parameter is the separation. <coughs> so I made the uh, special assumption that, uh, you know, of the, just the homogeneous case, but I could easily extend this. So if you recall, earlier I said there was uh, an overall block connectivity matrix that was like k by k if there were k communities, right? I allowed for all like arbitrary probabilities of connectivity across different communities. But just to display the results, uh, you know, I have the general results in the paper, but just to kind of uh, make it uh, uh, easier to represent the result, I'm just going to take the special <laughs> case. So this is the homogeneous case where the diagonal is little p and the off diagonal is q. Right, meaning that the probability of connectivity within the same community is little p for any two communities, and for any, you know for all communities and for uh, different communities it's just little q. Right, and in the based on the intuition that I gave, I said that if you want to think about the difference p minus q, that should be large. Right, I should be able to have very different connectivity in the you know within the community versus across different communities. Right, and uh, here I've uh, standardized this. So what is like, you know, so for a Bernoulli random variable, the standard deviation is square root p, right? So think of this as then a standardized separation requirement. And here you can see that indeed as, you know, I have more uh, communities, so k increases, I have to have also more separation in some sense. This is in, you know, intuitive as I want to recover more communities, I also need like a strong separation requirement and also with increasing overlap I also need a stronger separation between them. And uh, the nice thing is we completely uh, characterize how these different parameters should vary in order for me to be able to learn the models. And the nice thing is because we have the stochastic block model as a special case, we do match the best you know, uh, known results. So in t both in terms of the number of um, uh, nodes in the network as well as the separation. So again, there are some lower bounds for this separation in some special cases, and in that case, we match. I mean, up to like polylog terms and constants. So those uh, have kind of not been careful in uh, keeping track of. Okay, so that's like the overall uh, summary of results in terms of you know being able to uh, characterize a model with, where communities can overlap and s ask how, based on increasing overlap, I have. Uh, I'm so sorry. Um, based on increasing overlap, how the performance degrades. So any questions? So, so the main overview of approach, as I said, is this is we we'll think of it as a moment-based approach. So we want to kind of count some small subgraphs, like these star structures that I described, and we'll first write down just these equations, right? Under exact moments, how do these equations look like? And uh, you know, in general, they'll be not tractable, but it turns out for this model, we can turn them into a tractable problem. Essentially, we can convert these equations to the one of solving a certain spectrum of a tensor. And this tensor also has some additional nice properties. So this is an orthogonal symmetric tensor. And for that, it turns out that um, a, a power method approach, so I'm sure you're aware of the matrix power iteration. 
So essentially an extension of that to the tensor case will make it uh, you know, an efficient algorithm to solve and also it's robust so we can do all the perturbation analysis and argue that you know, I don't need like my, the perturbations to be too small for this to work. Right? And that's where all this, the sample requirements came in. The number of nodes was that I required was essentially saying these are the number of samples for my empirical <coughs> moments to look similar to the exact moments. Right? And uh, yeah, so first uh, what I'll do is I'll just uh, mostly, you know, I won't be able to do both. Uh, uh, like there are two aspects. One is to study for this probabilistic network model, how do these moments look like? Like what are the intuitions, right? Why the star structure has a nice form of moments? And then the other part is this uh, tensor power iteration method. So again, it, you know, some of the things are uh, quite um, difficult to do compared to the matrix case. So in the matrix case, you know that uh, you know, if you start from a random initialization point, you converge to the dominant eigenvector of the matrix. Whereas in the tensor case, that's not true. You could converge to different points based on the initialization. And, uh, but it turns out this orthogonal tensor, there are no spurious local optima, which is very nice. And that's why we can have a tractable algorithm. And there are a number of you know, kind of uh, ideas about the tensor power method itself that I don't think I'll have the time to go into detail, but the, det you know, uh, the paper has details and I'll also be able to, happy to talk online, offline about it. So let me focus on like why, you know, this you know, kind of a uh, probabilistic graphical model, sorry, gra network model has a uh, uh, nice form of moments and how we can form tensors out of these uh, subgraph counts. Okay, so I won't go into related work. There is indeed a ton of related work on stochastic block models, you know, spectral clustering algorithm. I'm sure many of you are familiar by using kind of the, you know, spectrum of the adjacency or the Laplacian matrix and using that for clustering, right? So that's a very popular approach. More recently, there have been even convex optimization approaches for uh, uh, learning these models. And uh, I mean, indeed, like, you know, in the morning, we discussed about uh, these uh, exponential random graph models and they also you know use subgraph counts but then you know like the uh, it's not clear how whether learning is tractable in those models yeah so let me go to the uh, uh, form of these moments so although you know like the whole argument for this mem mixed membership model was to incorporate overlapping communities i'll just display the tensor forms only for the stochastic block model it's much more kind of it's simpler to uh, look at these moments for the stochastic block model and the details of extending it to the mixed membership model are in the paper so I won't be able to go into all the details. Yeah, so the first part before we even go to computing the moments, we'll first partition the graph. So this can be some random partition, right? So we, under this assumed model anyway, these are all are homogeneous, so it shouldn't matter. And they're all of just roughly the same size. And so think of like, you know, this, uh, will essentially think of the edges going from the set X to these subsets A, B, C. <coughs> and these all are disjoint. And uh, we'll see how, you know, think of like, you know, if I fix the communities of uh, the nodes in the set X, how do they map into these different sets, right? So once I fix the communities, I know these edges are all conditionally independent and I know the form of what the probabilities are of the, you know, of the edges appearing. And so, you know, I can then ask, uh, like, these different adjacency submatrices, how they, you know, what form they look like, right? I should be able to write this down. Uh, but we also need higher order information in sense it's not just that whether this edge is present or not. It's like a group of edges, whether they're present together or not, right? And that's the, always the notion of higher order moments, right? And in particular, as I said, we look at a star uh, tensor, which is looking at how, uh, uh, you know, so for a fixed node little x here, I want to ask what's the probability that simultaneously it has edges to each of these uh, nodes here into <coughs> these uh, subsets A, B, C. So, and I'll do this for every triplet uh, in the uh, subsets. And that's why I get a tensor, right? So I look at like every triplet of nodes and ask essentially how many common neighbors they have in the set x. And essentially, I make these sets disjoint because I want to preserve conditional independence. So why triplet here? 
I mean, why specifically you choose three star? Yeah, so I'll I'll come to that in a minute. So somehow think of it as like I could always do like larger subgraphs, right? And they should be, you know, if I do it with three, four should also be possible. But like with higher order tensors, it's like computationally it could, it could be harder to solve. And also sample wise, like, you know, like I need more number of samples for to estimate them efficiently. So I want to do it as low order as possible. But it's clear if I just looked at an edge by itself, it should not tell me <laughs> about communities, right? And even if I just like looked at two edges, it turns out it's not enough. At least it's not clear to us how to use that information. And three is the case where it's like the first time we know how to do this. Okay? And so this is also quite different from other, you know, um, kind of methods for social network analysis that look at subgraph counts. Right? Because like typically you would count just all the subgraphs together in the network. So you get just a scalar parameter. But here we are tracking like these objects across different triplets. And so that's why we can get a tensor object but without going to like larger graphs. And intuitively, you can see that there could be enough information in just these I know, simple subgraph structures because I'm uh, kind of maintaining it uh, all across different sets of nodes as well. Yeah. So why stars in this situation? Yeah, so you'll, I'll see, you'll see in a minute that, again, the conditional independence relationships are okay, you know, kind of crucial. Think of it as in the star with the, over these disjoint sets, right? All these are kind of, these communities are all different, you know, they're all like drawn independently. And condition on them, all these edges are also conditionally independent, right? Whereas these properties are not true, for instance, when there's a triangle, right? So it's kind of harder to analyze those moments. Uh, it kind of the nice form is with these uh, three star structures. And uh, so this was the block model that I described earlier, right? The probability of connection, I can write them down in terms of uh, by expressing these community memberships as these v vectors pi. And then, you know, I, I choose the probability of connectivity based on my communities, right? And now I'm going to just, you know, just rewrite the um, uh, kind of edges across different uh, sets uh, using this property, right? So let me just say that, uh, let me say that the probability of uh, ch some random node choosing community i is some lambda i, right? So I need these probabilities. And let me just collect like the communities of all the nodes in a set by this kind of capital pi, a, right? And now this is just like uh, going back to just this assumption of what the probabilities of edges are, right? So I can just write down that you know for the Bernoulli variable the probability is the same as expectation, right? So I'm just saying that the expected um, uh, set of edges going from uh, some node little x to this set a is uh, based on just these, uh, you know, product of these vectors with this matrix, right? And if I just rewrite it, just, you know, flip it around, this you can think of it as a linear map. So think of like there is a community uh, vector for each node, and when it goes to, you know, this uh, set A, the set of edges, right, is just a linear map based on my community, right, community vector. And this is kind of a convenient way of just expressing uh, or uh, edge, edge set here, or rather the probability of edges. And now the question is how the structure, uh, you know, changes with the tensor, right? So now I'm looking at multiple edges together, and the question is, does the linearity still go through, right? So the main, again, uh, the aspect is all the conditional independence of edges, right? So this gives to I hope that we could still kind of preserve this linear form for each part, right? So what I've done now is this is the uh, three-star count tensor. Uh, this is an element, right? So this was what I earlier said. I just count the number of common neighbors of these nodes A, B, C in set X, right? And this, uh, of course, I can just rewrite it in terms of the adjacency matrix, right? So I want all these three edges to be present, right? Only then I count it as a star. And then I'm just, you know, kind of adding over all these nodes here, right? I'm counting the total number of stars. And in the tensor form, again, if you're familiar with tensor notation, you see, see this immediately. Otherwise, believe me that these two are equivalent. So I can just express this as a tensor, which is the outer product of these neighborhood vectors to these different sets. 
Okay, so now the question is, I want to look at these expected moments, right? Because then I could argue with samples, I get close to these expected moments. So what works with expected moments would also, you know, the exact moments would also work with empirical ones. And so the first, again, uh, idea is to exploit conditional independence, right? I know all these edges are conditionally independent if I condition on their communities, right? So if I condition on the communities, and I know for each uh, subset of edges here, right, it's a linear map, right? So that was if in the earlier slide, I said that the set of edges that go from a node to this set A is a linear map of the community of X, right? So I can just rewrite this here, and all these three are conditionally independent, so they just are the same form. So this is a multilinear form, and now, you know, since this is like uh, uh, averaging over all the nodes in the set, I could again, uh, um, you know, approximate it as expectation of like a random uh, node in this partition, right? So I'm going to take expectation over that. And in this case, so again, here this is kind of special to the block model, right? The block model says that the node can belong to just a single community, or these vectors pi are just basis vectors. And if you think of it as a tensor, Right, the pi tends uh, outer product pi or outer product pi. This, you know, and you think about it like it's like just a diagonal tensor. Essentially, like only non-zero elements are ones where they are like equal, right? Otherwise, it's zero. And that's why you see here that if I take the expectation, I can have a low rank tensor. So here, the number of terms in this uh, decomposition is just the number of communities, right? Because lambda is the probability of uh, each community, right, so of some community i. And uh, so think of this intuitively, this expectation is say, let's say that with some probability lambda i, this node x was in community i. So in that case, I know that uh, the, uh, you know, kind of the number of three stars is of the form where I just choose like the ith column of my first linear map and ith of the second one and so on. And only these are the uh, forms that are from, um, you know, present. And so this is a crucial aspect because, again, you know, I won't be able to go into the details about the entire tensor algebra, but the aspect is, you know, this is a decomposition of the tensor, right? And each one is a rank one term because it's the outer product of just like, a, you know, three vectors here. And the number of terms is the rank of this tensor, right? And here the number of terms is just k, which which could be like, you know, which is, we know is smaller than n, which is the number of nodes in the community, right? So in the sense, uh, I can get a low rank tensor. So the rank of the tensor is lower than the dimension. And it turns out that many of uh, tractability we can obtain is because of this tensor form. So it's crucial that uh, it reduces to a low rank tensor because again, low rank tensors are easy to solve for. We can solve them efficiently, okay? And, uh, and, you know, so if not anything, the main picture to remember with the, from all this is to think of this in terms of a multilinear algebraic view, right? So think of like, a, you know, this was the, uh, uh, I earlier showed you the simplex, right, of uh, where the community vectors can lie. In the block model, they're just vertices, so that is you just choose a single membership. And then uh, uh, I argue that, uh, you know, the edges going into these different sets A, B, C are all conditionally independent. So I can view it as a multilinear map, right? So I fix, like, the community of each node in set X, and then here it's, like, just one node here. And then the, um, you know, when I transform it to this uh, set of three stars, right, they are just uh, these multilinear map, right? So I have some linear map for each of these uh, subset, and then uh, have the transformation of my community membership, okay? And that's how I get this uh, form. It's popularly known as the CP uh, form or the classical form for tensor decomposition. And this is kind of the main uh, aspect about uh, how, why these moments are the ones that lead to tractability. So in the next, I guess I have 10 minutes. Uh, it's answer two, right? Yes. So I'll just very quickly go over, uh, you know, like why this, I could argue it as being reduced to a power method iteration and give finally the guarantees of what what is it exactly we can recover, right? Like kind of the error in recovery. 
And so I won't go the, to the details of the mixed membership model. It turns out for mixed membership, if we directly just count the number of three stars, that's not sufficient to get a nice low rank tensor. But again, if I just essentially take the mean parameters and subtract out some of, you know, kind of in a, do some pre-processing, just using lower order moments, I can reduce it to again a similar tensor form. It's again a rank K tensor, where K is the number of communities. So we can you know, do this model as well, but I won't go into the details. Yeah, so let me very quickly go over to, uh, some tensor preliminaries. And uh, so, you know, so as I said, you know, we've been looking at tensors of this form, right? That uh, there is uh, like each term is a rank one term. And I have like k terms uh, in my decomposition. And I want to find this decomposition, right? So just very quickly, I want to you know, use the notion of a multilinear transformation of tensors. So the matrix case, I know that if I, you know, I can transform the row and column spaces of a matrix by just kind of multiplying right, on each, either direction. Right? And I can use, again, a similar notion even for tensor. I can essentially think of a linear transformation of each of the coordinates. Right, and I can define it as this map. I mean, these could have been also different matrices, right? But just for simplicity, I wrote. So you know, if the tensor had this decomposition form, after I do the uh, multilinear transformation, I have kind of done linear transformation of the um, a set of vectors for each uh, each of the coordinates. Okay. And uh, why this is useful? Because now I can use this to reduce dimensionality. I can you know get a a uh, matrix from a tensor, I can get a vector from a tensor, I can even get a scalar from a tensor, right? So if I, for instance, if I, you know, project the tensor in some, uh, you know, along some vector V along one of the coordinates, right? So then that becomes an inner product, which is a scalar, and the rest of them remain as they are, right? So meaning that this is a matrix, right? And if I project twice along certain direction, then I have this inner product square. Right, and the other uh, coordinate is uh, again this, you know, uh, remains as before, and so I have a vector. And we'll see that for power iteration, these notions are important, right? Because I want to, in the matrix case, what was I doing? I was looking for a, a vector in the span of this matrix and asking whether it's a fixed point map, right? That's how I'd get eigenvectors. And there's a similar notion here that if I you know, project along now instead of along one of the coordinates, two coordinates. And if it's a fixed point map, then they are eigenvectors. And of course, I didn't tell you that how I could reduce uh, my original tensor to the, uh, to the problem of computing tensor eigenvectors. Uh, but it turns out that, again, is possible through multilinear transformation. So there are two aspects. Like I showed you the Kruskal form of tensor decomposition, right, of this form. I'll argue that it is possible to transform it to an orthogonal tensor, so where all these um, phi r's are all orthonormal. And then the second aspect is that the, I'll argue that there's an efficient method for computing uh, the, the you know, components when they're orthogonal, and in fact, they are the eigenvectors of this tensor. And that's why this notion of a tensor power method makes sense for computing them efficiently. And since I'm out of time, I won't go too much into those details. So I'll just show the power method, right? So this is exactly the power method. So as I said, I'll start with some random initial vector and then project twice along the direction, right? Along two, two of the coordinates, I'll uh, you know, see where, you know, using this tensor what the uh, output is. And this is just normalization, right? Because I assume all these vectors are normalized. So in the matrix case, it was just like kind of you were just doing this once, right? Now this is like twice. And again, symmetry is uh, important here because we are, again, we can uh, argue that we'll, you can also symmetrize the tensor. Right? It's the same notion as like symmetric matrix and like general matrices. And uh, so I won't go into these details. So there's also an optimization view of thinking of this as kind of finding the largest energy directions of this tensor. I won't go into those. I won't go any of this. I'll just give the main. I'll now say, like, we can use this um, tensor power method uh, to recover uh, the tensor. The, I showed you for three stars, I have a certain uh, decomposition of the tensor that I need. So I can recover all the terms in this decomposition. And from then on, to recover the uh, original parameters, it turns out it's just a 
a simple series of like linear algebraic operations. So you can recover everything efficiently. And these were my, and it turns out that the next point is that careful concentration bounds, right? So even with empirical moments, I can still, you know, run this algorithm and recover the communities efficiently. And so what we show is some norm bounds of being able to recover them efficiently, right? So this is the uh, probability of, uh, you know, this is my estimate of connectivity across different communities, and these were the original parameters. I can recover them efficiently. And this pi is like the uh, set of communities for all different nodes. And this row here means that I, I take some community i and look at the, you know, memberships of all the nodes in this community. And this is the error in recovering that. And again, I can do this efficiently. Uh, I mean, you know, so this one, if you think of the absolute error, it may appear it's growing. But then I have to normalize it, right, because it's also like the, uh, L1 norm of this, each of these uh, vectors is also like root n. I mean, sorry, is, is order n, so it will be like 1 over root n. So essentially, these perturbation bounds, like, you know, these um, tell me like I'm able to recover uh, the parameters efficiently. Okay, and uh, so, you know, so what we can do is kind of a uh, little more post-processing steps. We can argue that essentially, you know, think of again just in the stochastic block model. Uh, you know, say I've done some procedure, but there could be some errors in uh, saying like, w you know, the nodes belong to different communities, right? But I could do a correction step. So intuitively, you know, what I'll do is I'll do like a local vote, right? I'll ask all my neighbors what their communities are. And if I assume that there is higher connectivity within a community versus across communities, I'll just take like the Mac, you know, based on, you know, what the my major majority vote is, I'll say that's my community. Right, so this is kind of a local majority voting rule, and uh, this should be more robust because even if there are a few errors overall, I know that you know the majority of them are correct, so I can correct my uh, inferences that way. And it turns out you can do the same even for the mixed membership model. Essentially, in a weighted manner, you can correct again your local inferences based on all the neighbors, and based on that, we show like support recovery guarantees. I mean, essentially, in many of these applications, right, I'm not interested in kind of asking, oh, you know, am I in this community 50% of the time or 51% of the time, right? It's mostly like I'll have threshold. I, you know, I'll just ask, you know, for, for this node, give me a list of significant communities. And also, you know, can you guarantee that in these communities for sure that this node does not belong, right? So these kind of threshold uh, questions should be easier to answer. Right, and uh, what we show is we can do it with zero error with high probability. Meaning for all the nodes, we can guarantee that, you know, if the membership is significant, I'll guarantee that my answer is S. And if it's not, then the answer is no. Uh, the thing is there is a gap between like kind of, you know, these strong entries and there's some intermediate entries where I may be confounded. Right, and that depends on like because I, you know, I may not, I don't estimate all these probabilities efficiently. And based on that error, there may be some intermediate region where I may not be able to tell you the correct answer. But like the strong entries and the weak entries of uh, uh, my community membership, I can tell you correctly with high probability. And that's the um, main result of the paper. So just to conclude, uh, uh, what I argued was that uh, we can uh, you know, use probabilistic uh, network models where uh, uh, you know, we can incorporate overlaps across different communities, and we can uh, use just low order moments. So just based on these star structures with just three leaves, if I count this across different sets and form a t third order tensor out of it, I argued that this has a very efficient tensor form. So mainly it's a low rank tensor, and then I can, um, you know, transform it to a, an orthogonal symmetric tensor for which we can run the power method, which is very efficient. And this is what, in fact, we've been now programming on the GPU and you know, scaling it up to a, you know, kind of even up to hopefully a millions of nodes, right? And I see, again, the behavior across different data sets, how they behave. And uh, so that's the kind of key point here. We have a computationally efficient algorithm for learning these models, as well as a statistically efficient algorithm as well, right? We don't, like we can learn uh, with number of samples scaling not too badly with as the overlap increases or the number of communities increase. 
And that's kind of the key point, uh, I would say, of this work. All right, thank you. We have a short time for some questions. So, so coming back to the one of the questions that you asked and of an application of this. So if all the time you're interested in is to find out, given a node, what communities it belongs to, uh, do we still need to know the entire network and do the whole thing? or? So yeah, it's that's the point, right? So as I said, if you only compute these structures, it's enough. So if somebody just told you, like, like how many kind of common neighbors like these sets of nodes have. So essentially, what I need to know is uh, uh, an induced graph of me and my neighbors. Yeah, so you can just do it based on like local, just locally, I can just square it. So that is actually if they know what joint it is, they already belong to. No, so you don't. You only measure this. Ca uh, structures, right? What I was, you know, arguing in those equations are this is how the equations look like. Like if I want to count, if I count the number of stars, and then I ask how it relates to the parameter of the model, these are the set of equations that tell that. And we are essentially solving those set of equations. That's why we can get the parameters. But for just the method, all I'm doing is just counting these star structures across these different triplets, right? That's all I'm doing. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Um, my question again for that is that what you used as the triple star uh, structure for just to design, uh, define which proper, proper, proper properties does the user X have? Instead of if we just use a duplex, saying that if we want to discuss the uh, overlapping area of two communities for a certain user X, and we can only discuss the proper, proper property of A and property of B. So that's not enough, right? By what happens? So essentially, the moment tensor form, I mean, the moment form is the same, mm -hmm. but it's a matrix, right? So think of it as like I have a matrix where, uh, you know, essentially I have, I know the matrix is of the form, so let me call it like the M2, right? The expected, this one condition on, say, the uh, communities of A and B. It's again of the similar form, right? I'll have a FA <coughs> and then the expectation of like the what the community of node X could be, right? Overall, because I'm doing it for all the X, right? So that's an expectation. And then I have kind of two matrices, right? So essentially, I have a form. Think of it as I have a matrix, right? So this is some diagonal matrix here. And uh, in general, you know, I can't recover these matrices FA and FB from that product, right? And that's why the SVD is unique, because it's orthogonal. I can only recover the basis for that. But I don't know how to recover you know, the set of vectors that all have the same basis, right? And in the tensor case, it turns out that you can you know, recover. You have much more information. I mean, of course, general tensors are hard, even though you need like maybe identifiable, you may not be able to recover. But we show that we can reduce it to a tractable setting where we can achieve. Uh, recovery. So the reason is we want to, because we want to apply the tensor spectral method to, to solve this question. No, I mean the reason is that matrix is not enough, right? The matrix only gives you the span of these uh, parameters, and that's not enough for me to identify the parameters. Any other questions? Yes. Do you have a question? Mm -hmm. All right, if there are no more questions, let's thank our speaker.